Hello and welcome to Data City Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Dora Busius, the Senior Director of Data Strategy and Architecture at Stryker. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DBTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. And Today, we are joined by Dora Busius, the Senior Director of Data Strategy and Architecture at Stryker. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Dora, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and having this chat with you today. I'm so excited you could join us today. I really appreciate it. A longtime friend of Dataversity. Um, and we just we just love you and um, really excited to hear more and learn more about your career path. So tell me, so you're the Senior Director of Data Strategy and Architecture at Stryker. So what does that mean and what is it you do? Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so Stryker, just to put a little bit of perspective, it's in healthcare, it's a medical technology company. We're actually the leader in the space. So that means the company um, uh, designs, manufactures, commercializes, you know, medical devices, medical equipment. So my role is definitely very close to data strategy and architecture, I was saying. It's really driving data strategy and architecture for the company at the global level. Uh, so a lot of this focuses on the, the governance, the MDM, the stewardship, the quality, the data information architecture of things. I'm, um, uh, you know, and and set up this, this uh, new function from the ground up for the company uh, with my peer on the business side uh, we're co-accountable for this program on the architecture side it's architecture for you know across domains across commercial divisions across regions across different other functions and it's the architecture for anything from the transactional side of things all the way to analytics and it's an area that I'm really very very passionate about but you know we're talking about data and obviously some of the technology aspects come into it, but I always, um, you know, Shannon, for the longest time, I always say, and I believe this, and I leave my every day like this, and I, and I try to get my team to think the same way, I'm a business person first and foremost. So what I do is really how do I bring the best practices around data and data management and architecture into the organization so that I can help the patients really and our customers, right, do better by helping my organization uh, be a healthy organization, but better quality. Uh, well, we've got the most best quality products out there, but I'm saying the products out there help the, the patients, you know, what are business strategic objectives? So really always driving with what are business objectives first and foremost. And that's why I think of myself as a business leader first, how can I do better there? And then pull in anything around data and technology that I can bring to the table, uh, myself, my team, you know, the function. So how did you then come to create this role? You said you created it. And you have a business partner on the business side. So where do you sit? I sit in IT. I've uh, actually been in IT my entire career, which is rounding it up to about 30 years, about 20, almost 28 years now. Uh, I've always sat in IT, but again, I've also, because I've had enterprise architecture roles for probably the last 17 to 20, 17, 18, 20 years. I don't know, time time goes by fast, right? I've always been in roles that, that have enterprise uh, 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 perspective and enterprise accountability. I've been doing enterprise architecture, always going the deepest in data. 
And so I've always felt even though I'm in IT, it's almost like having a leg in IT and a leg in the business, especially because I'm always trying to drive with, what is this going for my business? What business goal is this going to help? How can I help progress this business objective better? How can I make this better for the customer or the patient or the organization as a business that needs to thrive, right? Not just survive. Um, so Striker, like so many other companies, has grown in silos. So from the data perspective of things, how do we look at things across at the enterprise level, drive the synergies, obviously with data governance and trying to get to speak the same language on many things like, you know, what is a product? What is a customer? Right? What are the different KPIs? You right. need to bring the different silo teams together. So how do we infuse best practices in this data management world? So how do we go about doing that, bringing that expertise in? And I've been with Strike for about six and a half years now, wonderful company. Um, uh, so bringing that expertise, really just putting the case together and say, hey, here's where we can do uh, uh, better, you know, better manage it. I mean, at the enterprise level, drive those synergies, get to speaking the, lang the same language, common language that can help drive operational efficiencies or can help really with um, uh, new revenue streams by monetizing our data, right? I mean, everything around this, again, in my mind, typically is by managing my, you know, the data in the organization. How can I help grow my top line? Because I am helping to provide a better customer experience, for example, which would attract or retain customers or bring in a new revenue stream, right? Or how can I perhaps cut down costs by bringing in operational efficiencies, streamlining some processes, not having to reinvent and do the same thing, data quality, for example, over and over again. Or how can I look at data and help that to mitigate risk, be proactive about it, safeguard my organization, right? So bringing a lot of that, how do I drive those synergies on the enterprise level? Kind of, uh, you know, put the strategy together, obviously got the executive buy-in, um, uh, but it is very important that this is not just IT driven. I look at this thing to be successful in any case as a very close partnership between the business and technical teams. So the way we've structured it is that this global level function, uh, myself and my, my business partner that sits in the business, and her title is, uh, her title is uh, Senior Director of Business Data Governance. We are co-accountable for driving uh, uh, this for the organization. The yeah. organization, so the uh, benefit that will come from this, so, we set it up at the enterprise level and, you know, driving and executing and seeing the um, outcomes from, from doing this. That's a great model. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just curious, uh, did you, how do you find the business opportunities, um, whether to grow revenue or to drive efficiencies? Um, is it through that partnership or, you know, are you sitting in on executive meetings or, you know, how, how are you finding those opportunities where the yeah. business needs are? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, so it's really being very intentional about looking at it. So even, even if something in data management has to do with bringing out the, the right technology, that mm -hmm. right technology is it has to enable some very specific business capabilities. And those are the business capabilities that we will focus on because it will help a very specific business problem that we're trying to solve for or mm -hmm. you know, a business objective that we have. So the opportunities are all around us. There is so much really that we can do in our organizations. And, and Shannon, with, like I said, almost 28, I'm typically rounding it up to almost 30 years right now, being exposed to it, a lot of different verticals, right? I've worked in finance, in insurance, a bit in retail, in healthcare, medical technology here. I'm saying this because I'm seeing it across verticals of experience it, right? The opportunities are there. And we do have the opportunity to better manage our data to really get more out of it, right? So um, prioritizing, actually, I think it's a harder thing to do versus finding the opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities. I think is how do we prioritize right. what do we focus on? Mm. Being a very close partner with my business counterpart helps, but you know, 
I always say to really successfully implement and get value out of implementing a very intentional and thoughtful data strategy, it's not one person or two people or one team, right? So we really, that partnership really understanding, you know, what are the strategic, what is the business strategy? What are very specific strategic business goals? Okay, so taking that, uh, how does that, would that connect with the data strategy? How do we, um, you know, start prioritizing the demand there, seeing what is the biggest impact? I mean, we have different frameworks that we've developed as to, okay, if all of these areas could be areas that we can do better. Um, we did develop a framework that looks at, for example, you know, what, what is the, the risk? How is it helping us from a financial perspective, from a risk perspective, from an operational uh, efficiencies perspective, right? And so we apply that, but also um, initially we even interviewed across the organization, really trying to understand, okay, we kind of know, we think we know, but let's just put a little bit more structure on this. So we actually did interview across regions and functions and divisions and say, okay, what are your biggest problems that are related to data, especially master data? Because we started focusing, it's multi-year roadmap and a journey, but we started focusing on very specific data domains. And even within those data domains, we prioritize. But we kind of knew the issues, but we did try and just, hear from the organization, across the organization, what are your biggest problems? And the biggest problems in terms of what gets delayed or what gets what it's broken, what can become even better from a business efficiency or effectiveness or opportunities. So we took all of that, we synthesized it, we looked at it, we um, uh, connected it to our bigger business strategic objectives, we put a plan together, and with our executive steer call, we agreed this is what we're going to focus on. And that is important to do, actually, because then as a lot of demand comes from across this global, Strike is a 17 plus billion um, dollar organization. It's a large organization, right? 46,000 people. Uh, so having a very um, um, uh, well-known and intentional roadmap in terms also of not, not just the processes and, and the tools, but what business problems are we going to solve? What data should we focus on to solve these particular business problems? That helps us because the demand is always coming. So we're staying true to, to you know, we've done the work. We looked at all of the issues. These are the highest ones in terms of the business impact. We're staying true to that. Of course, sometimes things do come that we might need to, you know, reassess and pivot. Can just be locked without really taking into consideration the situation at the time. But that's typically how we do it, and it's it's a conversation with the business and the technology teams really too, because from there you learn a lot about hey, there is an opportunity with the business here. That process keeps breaking, for example, because of the data quality issue. I'm making it up, but I mean that could be a, a you know. I think that's a very usual um, uh, thing that we see, and it's an indication of an of an area that you know we can we can improve on. I love it. Well, you mentioned you know you you um, been sitting in IT for a while, and you have quite a bit of experience as an enterprise architect. But so let's back it up then a little bit. Um, so when you were a child, a very young child, did you dream? I'm going to be an enterprise architect when I grow up. <laughs> what was that dream? What was that original dream? Not quite. I didn't know what an enterprise <laughs> architect. I didn't know anything about data. Uh, folks may not know I was actually born and raised in Greece. And, you know, I was going to high school. It was actually a brand new model of a high school setup. And I pretty much had to make up my mind as a junior in the last senior year of high school, what would I focus on? And at that point, you know, I used to love reading and writing. And I always thought, you know, I, I want to go into literature. I want to be a professor of reading and writing and literature and things like that. And that's Greek, right? Because I, like I said, I, I, was, I was born and raised in Greece. But it just so happened, I also took this basic, basic, the programming language, which I liked. And to be honest, Shannon, the decision uh, kind of like went like this. It was a very practical decision. I said, okay, 
At that time, there's about 40,000 people waiting to be hired on, you know, to be a professor. Back then, there was not too many private schools, colleges. It was mostly, you know, state colleges in Greece. Now the situation is different. So it was really a very practical uh, decision saying, by the time I go through the right schooling and able to get a job like that, there'll be a lot more people waiting to be hired. I love this, but I also want to be able to make a living. I like this basic programming. This is different. I really think this will be the profession of the future. So, you know, I made a decision at that point to focus more, take more courses like that, uh, the last year of high school. And then after that, I, um, yeah, I made a decision to um, come to the United States. I have two siblings that were already here to study computers, the software side of things. It wasn't anything about data, software side of things. The schools were not as good in Greece at the time. So I came here, plus I have my siblings here. So yeah, my first degree was an associate's in data processing. That was my very first degree. Wow, that's amazing. So you say your first degree, how many degrees do you? Well, after I got the associates from this technical school in data processing, it was very much computer classes. I said, this is scratching the surface. So then I went uh, uh, to Quinnipiac in Connecticut. I got my bachelor's in computer science. Um, to graduate with a bachelor's, I had to do an internship, a three-month internship to even be able to get the degree in hand. And I did that, but that internship turned down into a full-time job offer, which I accepted. And that's how I started really being in IT. Later, I went back, a year later, I went back and I did my MBA uh, in terms of formal uh, um, you know, academics. I, I never really stopped learning. I mean, to the day I die, I think I'm going to keep on learning. I'm very curious and inquisitive. You know, I've done a couple of certifications after that, but the most formal in terms of degrees was, was those three. But about that time is when I started in IT. And really, I started as a mainframe COBOL programmer. I was oh. doing COBOL and JCL and Assembler and working on IMS and DB2 databases and learning about hierarchical and relational databases on the mainframe. Um, but, you know, how I ended up with enterprise architecture, to your point, um, because I always want to keep on growing and learning, I actually, although I was doing mainframe and writing COBOL, programming and JCL and CICS during the day. In the evenings, I would teach myself new skills. And back then in the mid 90s, I basically taught me the entire thing Microsoft Office Suite, including Access, which I got Microsoft certified back then. But oh. Access is a database, right? Hmm. Back then, you have the database, you had a little bit of programming, the reporting, all of that. So that got me out of the mainframe. I got into rapid application development team, as it was called, the RAT team, in more software uh, programming. Fast forward, the one thing that I realized, I don't know how, I don't know why, but even when I was doing mainframe, you know, COBOL work, I realized that at the end of the day, when I was doing, when I was part of the uh, COBOL team, we were producing a lot of the financials for the company, which was a retailer. So I realized we're looking at these reports. We're creating these reports, financials that were going to the CFO of the organization and other CXOs of the organization looking at these things. So I realized, okay, this is data. We're looking at this. Like our decisions are being based on this. So it's very important that this is good because as we say if I look at garbage garbage in garbage out and being also a software programmer you know I had the opportunity to actually do everything from gathering requirements to designing to building to training like I even as part of the RAT team I built a whole platform that basically was kind of like yeah uh a whole platform for the loss prevention department back then. Everything from the day-to-day -to, -day to the actual deep functional capabilities to, uh, because it was its own silo to, you know, the HR components of that department. So I ended up doing the whole thing. And what I realized is, okay, for this to really sustain, I have to have a really good solid architecture. So I was really passionate about, is the data I'm looking at good? And am I building this in a way that it's not going to break, that it's going to sustain? Like, how good is the architecture? And I've always looked at 
somehow, you know, okay, how solid is this? What else is impacted? What's going to break? And throughout the years, I ended up getting into enterprise architecture roles. Like I said, for the past, I don't know, close to 20 years now, I've been in EA type of, of functions, uh, which is important because I've always been driving with that enterprise mindset, be it data, mm -hmm. be it technology, be it business processes and capabilities. What I'm doing here, who else will be impacted downstream, upstream? How do I design this to be a very solid foundation that as new demands come, can flex, can scale, and know, by the way, what I'm looking at, well, what runs through those pipes, that data, again, garbage in, garbage out. So how do I make sure that it's really good data? And having worked for a financial services company when the crisis happened, we had to figure out everything. That's when I got deeper into the whole MDM and data governance and data and information architecture, uh, data quality aspects of it. So a couple of things here. Mm -hmm. um, so what made you decide to get an MBA? What was your focus for your MBA? Ah, thank you for the question. I think for me, it was um, it was similar to that thought of what I'm looking at these executives are based on the decisions are they're making business decisions so for me it was like okay this is great all the technical stuff but what are we doing that for uh you know we're not building this system just for the sake of the system it's actually it's doing something for the business so it, i don't know it was just in my mind it was almost like i want to combine the technical expertise with mm -hmm. understanding more about the business. So how can I use this technical expertise as a tool to help my business go forward? So it wasn't, it, that was really just the thought. I, I don't recall like a particular thing that triggered it other than just that thought. We're doing this. These executives are looking even as simple as these financial reports, making decisions. So there's a business usage for this. How can I learn more about the business and running a better business? So that's what really triggered me to go more into get an MBA versus a master in computer science, for example. And it's something that I continue to, to, to drive with. This is why even when we started, I said, I think of myself as a business leader first and foremost, you know, mm -hmm. even though I sit in technology and IT and a little secret here when people say, you know, business and IT, and I say it sometimes too, but it's it's like IT is part of the business. I'm, I'm of that school of thought, right? Um, and interestingly, you know, I say this even to my team when we're talking about what do we focus on? Um, I always say, okay, what are the technical skills? What is the functional and business acumen side of things? What can we get better there? And oh, by the way, also communication. We can't forget about communication and leadership behaviors. To me, those are the three buckets that I always, for myself, but my team, the people that I uh, work with or, um, or I mentor, you know, I, I always look at this at what is the technical skills, if, if this is the area, what is the functional business acumen side of things that we want to focus and develop on? And then even though we're technical IT or data people, you know, the communication and working with people and the leadership of, um, uh, behaviors are important too. They absolutely agree. And um, very interesting. I, I love that uh, path and mindset. Um, I think it's one of, as you mentioned, curiosity, um, finding a trend here uh, and just natural desire to keep learning, which is, you know, very impressive. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. Um, so having been in data for so long, then um, as being, having it been a huge part of huge focus of your career. Um, what is your definition of data? Ah, what an interesting question. And I forgot to say, by the way, I spoke about software programming, but I mean, I did go deeper in data. So I've done data engineering, data modeling databases. I was a DPA, I was a data modeler. I, you know, I was a data developer, all of that stuff. 
Uh, what is my definition of data? I haven't even thought about it, but for me, um, hmm. so for me is how do I, how do I look at this thing that we call data, the bits and the bytes, how do I put it in context to help me really um, decide what should I focus on next, right? It's an interpretation of things and what they are, but, but, and I go between data, not, not to get too technical here, and I know not everybody possibly thinks of it that way, right? But um, data and information, right? So for me, data, it's the very, uh, you know, uh, how do we represent what, what things are? But then I tend to think of it putting in a business context, and that's when I start speaking about information and information architecture rather than data architecture, data management, right? So I don't know, I haven't really thought about it interestingly enough, but that's how I think of it. It's the representation of what things are and what they mean and how can that help me, uh, um, help inform or drive my decision for the next thing to do. I like it. Uh, and so, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? I think um, I think the, we're, at a, we're at a point where the jobs will probably increase and probably a little bit different too, because with machine learning and AI is doing more and more with it in terms of processing a lot of different data. There may have been jobs that people were doing that now AI will pick up, but I think um, uh, there will be a, a more need for people that can really not only work with data, the technical side of things, but can also communicate with folks that are not data folks or technical folks, what is important to do what we do in the data management world? And what does this mean? How does that help the business go ahead? So I think we're gonna see a lot more of those roles as well, mm -hmm. you know, almost like translators, you know, business, trans business data translators, if you will, right? That just puts it into context. In addition to the more technical roles, right? But, you know, with AI and machine learning taking off even more and processing not only large amounts of data, but just doing things and automating things that people had to do before, we may see a little bit less of those types of roles and more of the types of roles that just need to bring a little bit more of that, of that context and that human side of things where we're looking at something, we understand it, and we translate and communicate what it means and how we're using it. But I certainly think that this is a field that will continue um, uh, be very, very relevant, very current, and very critical to the health of our businesses and really our everyday life. Because everything we do, right? I mean, it's, I, I always, I typically think and say that data is the lifeblood of the organization. But if you think about it, even in our personal lives, we can't do anything without the data that we're looking at on our phones so that we hear from other people. I mean, it's all around us. It's part of life. Uh, absolutely. So what advice then would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? I would say it's a it's a great field to be in. Um, I, the advice that I would give is there's a lot of different areas that you could focus on. Mm -hmm. So figure out what it is that you like, focus on that and get really good at it. I always believe in knowing your craft, you know. Um, you may know a lot of different things, but what are you known for? So in the data world, do you want to go more into, you know, the data quality aspects and the data engineering aspects, the data visualization aspects, the data modeling aspects, you know, the, um, uh, you know, data governance, whatever it is, uh, maybe, you know, more than one. I would say get really good at that. Know your craft. But in addition to that, Please be intentional about understanding the business you're in and how you can use those technical skills and that data to help progress the business. And oh, by the way, we cannot really do that successfully without getting really good at communicating about it. So my advice would be figure out which area you're more passionate and passionate about, get good at it, but don't forget learning the business, speaking the business functional, don't speak in technical terms, even if you're doing data engineering, 
whatever you're doing when you're speaking about it, speak about it in business terms, which is why you we also have to get really good at communication. But I think there is a great future in, in this space, more so than ever before, in my humble view. I totally agree. And it's um, for somebody who's not comfortable with communication, how do they get better? What, what are some resources that you found that are helpful? Um, I say practice is mm -hmm. probably the most critical. Well, obviously, um, take communication courses and communication is pretty vague, right? Depending on what you want to do, maybe it is about storytelling, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it is about presentation. Maybe it is about influencing, right? Depending on the role. So again, mm -hmm. how do we deconstruct that problem? Figure out specifically what it is that we need to focus. So look for, look for training courses. That's one thing. But then in my mind, it, the best results come from combining the, um, the learning, the academic or just learning theory, the theory with the practice. So then experience it as much as you can, practice it as much as you can. So that could mean that, you know, find groups that you can be part of, that you put yourself into those uncomfortable situations so that you can start practicing those communication skills that you want to get better at. Uh, you know, there's, there's um, groups that people, um, it, it could be things like, and I'm not talking about Toastmasters, you can do that, but I'm talking, for example, um, 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 join your local, maybe there's a data management group, maybe there is a, you know, IT group, whatever it is, right? Uh, go to conferences, actually practice the skills that you're learning theoretically um speak to your manager ask for opportunities that can help you stretch in the areas that you're most comfortable with because not only are you going to get better when you practice it you're also going to show the initiative that you're okay getting out of your comfort zone when you get out of your comfort zone you're growing new opportunities open up it's actually good for your career <laughs> right uh, so you can do that too, or, or, you know, find a body also, you know, sometimes, you know, before a big meeting, for example, you want to practice something, another idea could be practice it, record yourself and watch it. And this is something that I learned from, I was part of a leadership training program once, a week long uh, leadership program that I did with G, uh, G. Crotonville in New York, for those that, that know about this. And one of the biggest takeaways for me as part of this leadership program was an exercise that I had us do where they recorded us. And uh, then we watched the recording. Now it was something around communication and I was trying my best to, to, to get better specific things I was working on. And then when I watched the recording back and watched myself with the exercise, I could see, oh, wow, how it is in my head. It's not how it comes across. So from there, I think a good tool is for those things that we want to try, you know, practice it, try it. But then, yeah, for something big like that, I do it sometimes. I practice it. I record myself. Then I watch it. And then I try it again. And I try it again because it's different when you observe it from out, from outside if you will versus in our own head we don't always pick up on all things very very good advice um and just to kind of summarize so find your passion hone that passion to uh, a skill that you're very good at and then step a little bit out of your comfort zone and get a little uncomfortable and learn something new and learn that soft skill of communication um if that's a if that's not something that comes naturally <laughs> yeah but yeah you know Sharon, I would also say even if we are good at communication I always believe in there is always room to get better so even if you think you're good at it I would say keep on trying to get better because every situation is so dynamic with communication every person that we speak with every instance that we speak with that person depending on the situation you know there's always a lot of variability there um, and, and I would say underlying all of that, be very intentional and thoughtful about it. You know, it's not just going to happen. So what I've learned throughout my career, everything that I've done, it didn't just happen. I had to work for it. 
But the other thing that I've also learned is that there's no big bang things happening. Every little thing that I've done or that I've stretched that I went over, every little thing adds up. And then you look back and you're, wow, this big thing happened. But I didn't set out to do this big thing. It's it's the little incremental change that actually results in like a, 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 a you know, a, accomplishing, attaining, you know, hitting, hitting a goal that's so much, so much bigger. So do I you really admire that about you? Um, it's, you know, listening to uh, your curiosity um, is impressive, your desire to learn. I have this um, quote from Brene Brown um, that, you know, I'm here to get it right, not to be right, you know, and I think you emulate that so well. You're so curious about the business and wanting to help it succeed. And it's just all about that goal. Um, and through that, you've helped yourself and um, become really successful in what you do. Um, it's really impressive. Thank you, Shannon. I love that quote, by the way. I love that quote. I think curiosity, being inquisitive, asking questions, curious questions. I think no one knows everything. I think I can keep on learning, right? So I'm very intentional about being curious. I would say being consistent and resilient, like things don't happen overnight. And I think even with the younger generations, I'm looking, you know, my kids, for example, they're in 20s. And, and I know I'm like, you know, generalizing right now, but I think there's some truth to it with the younger generations We're more about instant gratification, right? So mm -hmm. there is a lot of value to really just kind of go through the process. Like I said, it doesn't happen overnight, but you got to keep consistent. Um, it, actually, that just reminded me, I was listening to Simon Sinek, uh, a, a little snippet on LinkedIn the other day when he was saying about something about, if I remember correctly too, you go to the gym, you come back, you work hard, you come back, you don't see a difference. You go to the gym the second day, you don't see a difference when you come back. Third day, you don't see a difference. But if you consistently keep at it, 30, 60, 90 days later, all of a sudden, what happened? You see the change. So, mm -hmm. so even in our data management world, especially because and you and I chatted about it a little bit earlier, right? Um, depending the role, like in my role, I drive a lot of transformation, you know, getting folks that have been used to working in silo to look at this, to say, how do we work together that if I do something here or anyone that works in master data management, for example, right, where well, you got to get people to work together across lines, across teams, right? If I do something here, I'm impacting somebody else, right? Uh, so... So, you know, that doesn't, driving that change of mindset and habits every day, it takes resilience, it takes consistency, right? It takes curiosity too, because by being curious, you ask, you learn, well, what is it really uh, that is, uh, that this person that you're talking to from this function on that region versus the other person from the other function, the other team, the other region, right? It's the same problem that I'm trying to solve, but how do I communicate to this team versus that team in a way they can understand? For me to be able to do that, I need to be curious to understand what it is that they do every day. What does their function do? We're all teams in the same company, you know, but you know, this team does it a little bit different than the other. This may be an operations team. This may be a finance team. And yeah, they're working with the same data, right? So how do I get them to work together? So that curiosity, asking the questions, being consistent, being resilient about it, I think um, I think those are, are very critical to lasting success, really. Again, great advice. And again, I think you emulate those things so well. It's really impressive. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, well, Dora, well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I really appreciate it. It's been fascinating. I, I love learning more about you and and getting an opportunity, an excuse to chat. <laughs> yes, I am honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me on and so great to see you. And hopefully our conversation is, is helpful to some folks out there.
Steve, well, thank you. And thanks to all of our listeners out there. If you'd like to keep up to date in the latest um, podcasts and the latest in data management education, you go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.